So let me tell you something about how I grew up. This might not seem uh, unusual to delegates from outside of India, but people from the subcontinent will, will understand how unusual it was. So, uh, my mother never cooked. She never entered the kitchen. Her whole life, she just detested cooking. My father loved cooking. So we grew up with a father who cooked and a mother who didn't. My mom worked. Uh, my father worked too. Every morning he would wake up and make us uh, our lunch boxes for school. So it was the leftovers of yesterday's potatoes in, in, those, you know, in, in bread, grilled with tasty toasties or whatever it was. It was the lunch that Baba, our father, made. Every Sunday he would give us oil massages, my sister and I. And uh, you know, it, it, we would spend hours you know, physically playing and enjoying ourselves with our dad. My mom was always a little bit, okay, you know, just enough now, please just, just go, go and do something else. <laughs> we love both. My mom pushed me to play rugby and that's when I, my 11 years playing for India, I owe to her. My father refused to allow me to play rugby. Yeah. Till, the day, till the day he passed away, he would shut his eyes when he walked into the rugby ground and watched me play. If I was playing, he was looking the other way. He wanted me to play cricket, to wear a cap so I didn't ruin my complexion and I was a gentleman. I mean, this is all very complicated. But the point of this is that when I used to go to my friends' houses for lunch and their, their mothers would be in the kitchen, I would say, What's wrong? <laughs> They're like, excuse me, I'm like, is your father ill? Like, no. I said, why, why is your mother in the kitchen? I said, well, what are you all about? I said, no, I, I mean, you know, shouldn't your father be cooking? And that, of course, leads me to the first of four points out of the hundreds and hundreds of points that are going to be discussed, uh, dimensions around the entire ecosystem of men engaging. I'd like to listen and learn more about four particular points. And the first one is, it is too late to tell our boys how to behave. The time has come and it's clear and present to show them, like I was shown. If a boy sees his father walking two steps in front of his mother, you can be sure that's the way he will treat his wife. For that, the lens has to be turned to us, to all the adults in this country and this world, to ask yourselves, when a child comes to the parents to ask, what clothes should I wear for my cousin's wedding? Does he go to his mother or to his father? And when the boy wants to know whether he should pursue arts or commerce or science after standard 12, does he go to his mother or does he go to his father? And it's that, I believe, that issue, the nucleus of everything is right there in that home. When we say long-term solutions, well, this is it. This is it. We turn the lens towards us and ask ourselves, do we unwittingly practice gender discrimination? Do we ask our daughters to come home before our sons? Do we actually say that, okay, you know, you can, you can do this, but you can't do this, and we wonder later on when we think about it, we say, oh, that's because somewhere or the other, I am gender stereotyped. The second issue I would love to hear more about and I'd like to just uh, talk about for briefly. If indeed this battle is to be won with the engagement of men, then which is that constituency of men that we can reach out to first? I've been starting to do this for the last year and it's not easy at all. But around every battered, molested, abused, raped woman is a confused father, is an angry brother, is even an ashamed grandfather. These are men in pain and they're, they're, they're adrift because the cords that bind them to Orthodox notions have been cut suddenly. They're standing in the village. Can they go to work with their head held? All kinds of complicated responses. I believe this is the prime constituency of men we should be reaching out to. And spend a lot of months, if not years, with them. So that they can turn around and say, nobody else is wife, and nobody else is daughter, and nobody else is mother. 
So I think that that, that, that cord of empathy is waiting to be touched. The third issue I'd love to uh, listen and talk about is the fact that it's too late now for institutions who can change uniforms in a month to say, look, if society is this way, so are we. I'm sorry, we just, we just can't take that anymore. You can, Mr. Judiciary. You can, Mr. Police Force. You can, Mr. Engineering College Institution. You can do this. That institution can and must change and doesn't have to wait for the lead from society outside. And finally, I think the entire approach to uh, the issue of men engaging uh, has to be multi-pronged, of course. But I'm, I'm going to take an example out of how they've been battling smoking in California. And I've been reading up a lot. I don't know, Kate, you're nodding, so you might be knowing about what started in the 80s. And they decided that although LA produces the largest number of films in the world that show smoking, nobody smokes. And so they were saying, this is a result of the last 25 years where they said, we have to engage socially, get into the schools and colleges, and magicians would come in to the middle of a school assembly and start taking black hankies out of their mouths to show the effects of smoking. And kids would just get totally, you know, and then there would be lilies and flowers coming out of the non-smoker's mouth, etc., etc. Rap was, was taking uh, was seed in America in the early 80s. I don't know how many people can remember that because I obviously am betraying my 47 years here. But there were competitions centered around smoking. Let's do, you know, let's do rap competitions. Graffiti was also beginning to take, uh, uh, to, to take a firm foothold in American pop culture. So there were graffiti competitions. So there was engagements in schools, in colleges. Assignments to take home for vacations, which normally used to be things like, you know, um, tell us about the Egyptian civilization was now about, now about smoking and the effects of that. Parents and teachers compulsorily had to every year do one assignment together and it was always centered around whether it's lung cancer or something to do with the ecosystem of smoking. And finally, the children as part of their community projects, community projects were created. Go and do an audit of how many people have been ill in the last six months in your neighborhood because of smoking. And I'm thinking, this is definitely, without doubt, creatively, if we use these examples, to, to actually not just wait for one or two or three, but to attack from many, many different directions in the most compassionate way. Thank you again for having me here. I'm looking forward to the next two weeks.